Chapter Twelve of Campfire Girls at Twin Lakes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. Campfire Girls at Twin Lakes, or The Quest of a Summer Vacation, by Stella M. Francis. Chapter Twelve, The Man in the Auto. Cautiously, Catherine and Hazel withdrew from the path into a thicket, and thence retreated along the path by which they had approached the house. They continued their retreat to the point where the path joined the automobile road, and where grew the thicket within which they had discovered the frightened runaway child. Now. I tell you what we ought to do," Catherine said. "We ought to follow this road about a mile, maybe, to get a view of the lay of the land, and then return to this spot or near it. We can get the information we want after we learn more of the camping possibilities of this neighbourhood, and can talk intelligently when we begin to make inquiries. And when we get back," Hazel added. We'll go to some neighbouring house and ask all about who lives here and who lives there, and of course we'll be particular to ask the name of the family where that icy bottle of perfume lives. That's the very idea," Catherine agreed enthusiastically. "But we haven't any time to waste, for it is nearly twelve o'clock now, and we have only a little more than an hour to work in if the motor boat arrives on time." We'd better not try to walk a mile. Half a mile will be enough, maybe a quarter, just enough to enable us to talk intelligently about the lay of the land right around here. They walked north along the road nearly half a mile, found a path which led directly toward the lake, followed it until within view of the water's edge. Satisfied themselves that there were several excellent camping places along the shore in this vicinity, and then started back. They had passed three or four cottages on their way, and at one of these they stopped to make inquiries as planned. A pleasant-faced woman in comfortable domestic attire met them at the door and answered their questions with readiness that bespoke familiarity. With the neighbourhood and acquaintance with their neighbours, Catherine and Hazel experienced no slight difficulty in concealing their eager satisfaction when Mrs. Scott, the woman they were questioning, said, "The people who have the cottage just north of us are the Pruitts of Wilmington. Those just south of us are the Ertsmans of Richmond, and those just south of the Ertsmans are the Grahams of Baltimore." I think I am not very well acquainted with that family. I am sure we would be delighted to have a group of campfire girls near us, and you ought to have no difficulty in getting permission to pitch your tents. This land along here belongs to an estate which is managed by a man living in Philadelphia. He is represented here by a real estate man, Mr. Ferris of Twin Lakes. He probably will permit you to camp here for a little or nothing. The girls thanked the woman warmly for this information and then hurried away. We don't need to call at the Graham cottage now, Hazel said, as they hastened back to the road. We have all the preliminary information that we want. The next thing for us to do is to get back to the point and meet the boat when it comes in. And have a talk with the other girls. I suppose our first move then ought to be to go to Twin Lakes and get permission from the real estate man Ferris to pitch our tents on the land he has charge of. The two girls kept up their rapid walk until within a few hundred feet of the drive that led from the main road to the cottage occupied by the Grahams. Then they slowed up a little as they saw an automobile approaching ahead of them. The machine also slowed up somewhat as it neared the drive. Suddenly, Hazel exclaimed, half under her breath, "It's going to stop! 
I wonder what for. Yes, and there's something familiar in that man's appearance, Catherine said slowly. Why? She did not finish the sentence, for the automobile was so near she was afraid the driver would hear her but there was no need for her to say what she had in her mind to say. Hazel recognized the man as soon as she did. Be careful, Catherine warned. Don't let him see that we know him. Just pass him as you would a perfect stranger. But they did not pass the automobile as expected. Although slowing up, the machine did not stop and for the first time the girls realized the probable nature of the man's visit to Stony Point. "'Oh, Hazel,' Catherine whispered, "'he's turning in at the Graham place. "'I bet he's come here to warn them against us,' Hazel returned. "'It must be something of the kind,' Catherine agreed, "'and then the near approach to the automobile "'rendered unwise any further conversation on the subject.' The girls were within a hundred feet of the machine as it turned in on the Graham Drive and found they had all they could do to preserve a calm and unperturbed demeanour as they met the keen searching gaze of the squint eyes of Pierce Langford, the lawyer from Fairbury. End of chapter 12